Well, good morning, everybody. I can hear you. Good morning, everybody. Happy Father's Day. Well, if there seems to be an echo in here, it's because there's not as many bodies uh, absorbing the sound waves. However, we are with our families up at family camp, and I'm sure they are with us as we are down here. And so all together, we say Happy Father's Day. And so we give our praise and our worship to our Heavenly Father. And we've got a visitor. Eric Savage is here from where? Virginia. You know, Virginia is where they invented the toothbrush. Because if it had been invented anywhere else, they would have called it the teeth brush. You can t tell that one when you get home. Uh, real quickly, just if you may have noticed that uh, today is Joseph and Terry McGann's, uh, I think it's their fifth wedding anniversary. And this week later on, uh, Carl and Kirsten French celebrate their, birth their anniversary on the 25th. So also Sharon McKillop's birthday is today. And then all the birthdays this week. If you brought your baby bottle or your big giant candy bottle full of pennies, you can set them on the, uh, the uh, altar in the back in the foyer. Um, the other announcements are here in the bulletin. And we just want to take time to think about those who can't be here. We pray for Kathy Hernandez. Uh, she is waiting for word. Uh, she should have a meeting this week, we hope. Wednesday, on Zoom, right? So we keep her in our prayers. Uh, for those of you watching on live stream, yes, it's me. Let me know if the glare off my head is too bright. We can dim some of these lights. Our sound techs back there are making sure I don't make any strange noises with my guitar as I move it around, so. All right, so, we are glad you are here, and I'm going to ask that you stand, because as we praise our Lord and Savior and exalt and worship his holy name, he is worthy, worthy of our, of our praise. <laughs> time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are before Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly to deny. Everybody come. Come. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the 
greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are. Thank you so much for allowing us all to be here. Thank you so much for uh, everybody that can make it. And uh, for Eric and Ben being here, Lord, that's such a blessing to see them. Uh, I just pray for all the families that are up at Heartland Camp, Father. I pray that they get home safely today. Uh, I pray that they had a, a wonderful time up there. And uh, Lord, I just thank you for all, all the fathers. I thank you for my father, Lord. I thank you for uh, my wife allowing me to be a father this year, Lord. It's, it's such a blessing. 
Uh, I just continue to lift anybody up that can't be here today in church, Lord. Pray for those watching over a uh, live stream. Uh, just continue to bless this congregation and everybody a part of it, Lord. We pray this in your name. Oh, Father, thank you for that prayer. Thank you for uh, my brother stepping up and doing worship with us, Lord. And uh, thank you for him speaking today. We ask that you ask the Holy Spirit to move in him. Give him the words he needs. As he, uh, as Partlo just preaches your word, Lord, I, I'm so glad to be a friend of his, Lord. He, he knows scripture very well. He knows you very well. So thank you for him stepping up and coming here today and being a part of your kingdom, Lord, and being your servant. Father God, thank you for everybody being here, as Joseph said. Thank you for me uh, uh, being allowed to be a grandpa, not only a, a father, but a grandpa now. And as Joseph mentioned, you allowed him to be a father, Lord. Father, we pray for everybody that's just not feeling good today, that's sick, that's having issues. My wife, as um, I know she's watching, Lord, that uh, I ask her that in faith that she just trusts in you, Lord, that this Wednesday they're going to give her the direction that she needs, the outcome that's going to calm her heart, Lord, that they will fix her when it's time. I just want to let her know that you're in control, Lord, and, and you're by her side. Father, be with everybody that's traveling back after they do worship, too, and service up there at Heartland. That you guide our family back safe, Lord. I just hope they had a wonderful time. I know they did, Lord. I miss them all, and I wish I was there. But, Father God, I'm here with you doing what I need to do, being your servant, as we all are here. We want to thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sing with us. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together. Bind us together with love. There is only one God. There is only one King. There is only one body. That is why I sing. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. together with love. There is only one God. There is only one King. There We don't have children's church today, but we do have this video. Gentlemen, gentlemen, welcome to another dad battle. 
How's anybody, and I mean anybody at all, willing to face our champion? Gentlemen, my son joined the golf team at school, so I bought him an extra pair of socks in case he gets a hole in one. Hole in one. His dad jokes are so effortless. See that? That's why he's the champ. That's nothing. The other day, my daughter said a good Christian dad would buy her a car. So I said, well, a good Christian kid would walk, because that's what Jesus did. <laughs> Fathers! Listen up, son. Just because God picked your nose doesn't mean you should. <laughs> when you start paying the bills, you can make some of the rules. Come on! Yeah. Yeah. Hold up! Who touched the thermostat? Yeah! That lawn isn't gonna mow itself. Let me stop what I'm doing and fix your boredom. Hi, Hungry. I'm Dad. <laughs> I love the smell of Home Depot in the morning. Oh, yeah. 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 Just wait till your mother gets home. Ah. Yeah. Oh. 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 Pull my finger. Nah. Just rub some dirt on it. Oh. 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 Proud of you. You can do hard things. I love you, no matter what. When God made you, He made something very special. Proudest day of my life is the day you made me a father. I thank God for you every time I get on my knees and pray. And then again, who gives this woman? No, no, no you look at me. You look at me. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? Mother and I do. <laughs> 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 All right, sermon's over. You know, Jim, we're praying for you. Uh, Jim was supposed to be speaking today, so you guys are going to have a good sermon. But, um, so uh, I got a text from Stan on Thursday morning letting me know that Jim is home. Uh, he has COVID, and so we're praying for him and asked me if I would do this. He said, I'm willing to drive down. And I said, Stan, no, I've seen you drive. So, no, but seriously. Uh, happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Um, my son, Ben, is here. He surprised me. 
uh, he and Tim had been colluding together and uh, to surprise me on this day, Father's Day, to be here. So I'm very grateful you're here, Ben. I love you. And I know you love your dad. <laughs> so anyways, what I want to do is I want to talk about our loving Heavenly Father. And I want to talk about how he demonstrated his fatherly love for us. And the only way he could, because what's the standard of a father, right? Every, I can only speak as myself, every young man, every boy uh, who has a father that encourages them and supports them wants to be like that. And that's how I was with my dad. And so God sent us his son. And throughout his whole ministry, he demonstrated who he is through his son. And I want to bring it to um, this point in time during Passover when he and his disciples are up in the upper room. And so if you have your Bibles and you turn with me to John just right at the end of chapter 13. This is just after, I want to kind of paint the scene for you. This is just after Judas had left. And it's really kind of, I don't want to say funny, but we really see some characters here with his disciples that really uh, John, who wrote this, shows us these, these kind of characteristics. Because remember, remember in the scene uh, in the upper room and Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And remember where John is, right? John is resting right next to Jesus. He's actually, as the Bible describes it, he's resting on Jesus' bosom. So he's right next to Jesus. And what does the Bible tell us Peter says? It says Peter gestured for him to say, hey, ask who this is. I got a little bit of Peter in me. I really do. And remember on the Mount of Transfiguration? Who was the one who started talking when he shouldn't? It was Peter. Hey, let's build some places to rest for everybody else. And that's not what the purpose was. But still, what we have here is we have a scene where God, through his son, wants to put his children at ease. And so just after uh, Judas leaves, in verse 31 of chapter 13, and I'm just going to read, then when he had gone out, that's Judas, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him himself, in himself. And will glorify him immediately. Children, yet a little time I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. Now I say to you also. Verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, here we go to Peter. Simon Peter said, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. And Peter said to him, Lord, why am I, why am I not able to follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus replied, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. That's the scene. That is what we call putting a subject to bed. No more to, nothing more to say. What's going through Peter's mind now? 
I think this gives us a glimpse a little bit. I want to go back to that point where Peter gestures to John to ask Jesus who was going to betray him. What we have here is we have a me. We've got doubts. Who am I? Am I really committed? Because I'm going to tell you, if you knew me the way I knew me, you would get up and walk out this door right now. I, you would. I'm, I'm not worthy to be up here. But who of us is? So take this imperfect, broken vessel to allow you to allow, be allowed to reach out to you through God's word. So now I want to go into chapter 14, and we're just going to read through verses 7. Because Jesus just basically said, sit down, Peter. What's his next words? Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. But if not, I would have told you because I am going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How are we able to know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. So I want to just kind of delve into these verses and just kind of touch on some points. I don't have a whole lot of elaborate um, you know, illustration points. I'm just going to talk about the Bible, all right? So through this section, actually going all the way through verse 14, what Jesus is doing is he's reiterating to his disciples that faith in him alone is going to be bringing salvation. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's a whole world out there that thinks there's other ways. There's a whole world out there trying to shut down Jesus. Who hasn't changed? Who has changed? The world has changed. Jesus' words are eternal. So do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, but if not, I would have told you. Now, what Jesus is talking about here in my Father's house is, what is he, where is he talking about? Heaven, right? Jesus is referring to the heavenly abode where God the Father sits in throne. Now, if you're a Bible flipper, get ready. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Actually, 1 through 4. This is what Isaiah was allowed to see. In the year of the death of Isaiah the king, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and raised throne. Let me know if this sounds familiar to you. And the hem of his robe was filling the temple. Seraphs were standing above him. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And the one who called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now get this. And the pivots of the thresholds shook from the sound of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. That's heaven's throne. Jesus is talking about that. It is a reality. He's not talking about some illustration. So, when he says there are many dwelling places, 
Jesus has already declared that God's symbolic earthly dwelling, the temple, it's insignificant in comparison to God's work right here through his new temple, Jesus. All right? So there are men in my father's house. These people immediately are thinking about the temple, but he's saying, no, no, no. We're talking about heaven here, and that temple doesn't matter. Remember in John chapter 2, this very book, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the saying that Jesus had spoken. So you got to remember, John is writing this near the end of his life, and he's compiling all of these memories and these events that took place, and he's giving us the insight, a lot of personal insight in the book of John. And when he mentions dwelling places, he's, you can almost see the imagery of when the Israelite nation was going through the, through the wilderness. And when they would stop and they would set up the tabernacle, they were given very specific directions on how to settle about the tabernacle. At the entrance to the fence around it was Moses and Aaron and the high priest, and then the 12 tribes were spread around it. And that's kind of the image you have. They all had their place. Because Jesus is talking to the to Jews. The, the uh, message to the Gentiles had not yet gone out. So I just kind of want to highlight that point when he says many dwelling places, that's what they're envisioning. Now, what do we envision? We who grew up in America, right? The land of opportunity, right? We picture big giant mansions and what have you. But Jesus just kind of nails this down. He says, because if it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, if it weren't so, I wouldn't have said anything. Take my word for it. I'm good. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now, I think it's important to note that he's describing an event that's going to tra uh, transpire after his ascension. All right? His, he's going to leave earth, and then he's going to come again. He's not talking about his resurrection. Some people are thinking that's what he's talking about, but that's not. It's his actual physical return to earth. And so it's not even something that really John dives into, but he's putting these words down because these are promises. This is something that has not happened yet, and it's going to happen. If you read the book of John, it's just event and promise, event and promise laid one on top of the other. The foundation is sound. And so here we are in this upper room, and it's just him and his disciples. Satan is no longer present. Satan left with Judas. And then he says, after he says, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. And what he's talking about is his betrayal, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. If you go to John chapter 12, verse 27 through 33, this is a very public, very public event that took place. Now, and this is what Jesus says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour, but it's for this reason I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Get, and this is so powerful. Then a voice came from heaven. I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Let's go back to that scene in Isaiah. What happened when the seraphs were singing holy, holy, holy? What happened? This is in heaven. It shook. Here we are on earth. 
Now the crowd that stood there and heard it said it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. This voice was heard. How ready is the world ready just to dismiss the reality of God when something transpires that just can only be explained by the power of God? Look what humanity does to explain it away. And then they will just ignore everything because it's easier that way. And Jesus answered and said, This voice has not happened for my sake, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be thrown out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to indicate by the way in which he would be lifted up. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be lifted up. So now Thomas speaks. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How are we able to know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. When he says, I am the way, that's it. It's over. The person and work of Jesus serves as a believer's pathway to God the Father. There is nowhere else to go. He says, I am the truth. There were divergent beliefs and traditions in the Jewish culture. And so it would be difficult for the Jewish person of the first century to know which tradition was Yahweh's will. At the beginning of John, when he's starting out, when he, his opening chapter, he says in verse 17, For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ. This is after he establishes a foundation that Jesus is the Word. And the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he says, I am the life. In John eleven twenty five. 25, this is that emotional scene where he's having a conversation with Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who had died. And you remember what Martha did when she heard that Jesus had arrived? She ran to him and said, Jesus, if you had been here, he would have lived. In 25, verse 25, he says, Jesus said to her, I am the res resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. See, Jesus is declaring himself as the source and the power that will enable the resurrection of the dead on the day of judgment. When God's people will rise in glorified bodies and will be with him. Jesus is denying that there is any other method but belief in him for receiving eternal life. In the first century, the Pharisees proposed that people could receive eternal life by obeying the law. But that was impossible. You can't obey the law. Because if you break one part of it, you've broken all of it. The law was to serve the purpose of letting everyone know that you need God. It was never intended to be a path to eternal life. It was intended to draw his people to him. And on the other hand, you had the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe in eternal life or the resurrection of the dead. So they wouldn't have even listened to this part. They wouldn't have got to him. It would have been moot. But it kind of makes you wonder, how does someone who claims to be a leader of the religious people, which is a monotheistic, uh, a theistic uh, country, if you will. That's their rule of law. But then say there's no eternal life. I, I never, I've never understood that. But Paul kind of, he didn't kind of address this. He did address this in Galatians 2, verse 16. And he's talking about this. He's talking about the law. And he's talking about Jesus in relation to the law. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just kind of breaking this down. He says, 
knowing that a person is not justified by the works of the law, if not by faith in Jesus Christ, and we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. So what he's saying here is you can have the law, but that's not, the, that's not where it ends. It's through Jesus. If you can't be saved through Jesus, there's no way you can be saved through the law. That's what he means when he says, knowing that a person is not justified by the works of the law, and if not by the faith in, in faith in Jesus Christ, you know what he's saying? He's saying, if you don't believe in Jesus, don't worry about the law, because it's not good enough. It's only through our faith in Christ. And then he says, if you had known me, you also would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. So Jesus is equating his presence with God's presence. And you, I just want to kind of sum this up, and I'm going to close now. And if the, my sermon is too short, I can keep going. But I just want to make sure that we understand that Jesus wanted his disciples to know that they were loved. That this act, that his suffering, that his betrayal and his suffering and his death and his resurrection was out of God's love. Remember earlier in Jesus' ministry, there was a religious leader that came to see him. Remember this kid, this guy, Nicodemus? Jesus threw some facts at him. Because how did Jesus describe his role? They call this the centerpiece of the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then what did he tell Nicodemus? You got to be born again. So Nicodemus, the old legal scholar, is like, uh, that doesn't compute. He says, no, man, you got to be born of the Spirit. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's bringing it all to a close here. And he goes on, and this is part of his, what he call his, uh, <sighs> sorry. Well, it is, but it's his farewell discourse. And he's just trying to put his disciples at ease because he knows what's coming. They don't know what's coming. A father can tell a kid, don't touch that, it's hot. A parent can tell a child, it's okay to sleep without the light on. But what's got to happen before the reality sets in? The kid has to be willing to sleep without the light on. The kid has to be willing to trust the parent, the dad, that that is hot. Jesus loves us. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We need to trust our Heavenly Father. He's got a plan. And this world is going anywhere but after that plan. And we are going to be called upon to take a stand. And we need to trust when everything else is dark, when everything else seems like we're being let down, we need to trust Him. Because these are easy words sitting in a church around fellow believers. But when we think we're alone, or when we think no one's watching, or when we think people are challenging us, or asking us to go do something we know we shouldn't go do, but we think we can do it without being corrupted, we need to follow God's love as our Heavenly Father loves us. Lord, just bless this message. Um, 
I pray that we would trust in you, our Heavenly Father. We just thank you for your love and your sacrifice to pave the way for us because we just couldn't do it on our own. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Dads, thank you for all the goodness you've brought to our lives, for guiding us with wisdom and truth when we insisted we knew it all, pointing out the right path even as we were taking a sharp right turn, showing us to love God and love others while we were acting wholly unlovable, chasing after us and walking us all the way home. Your compassion-filled heart and your merciful ways, your insistence that we don't have to be like everyone else, surely made us into the people we are today. Today, we want to honor you by thanking you for all you've done. Thank you for all the time in the practice fields. Thank you for all the long talks into the night. Thank you for not giving up on us when everyone else had. Thank you for believing in us far past what we could see in ourselves. If we're only able to visit you today in our memories, we know that what you gave to us still lives on. It's what we're able to give away now to those we love. It's a gift that is everlasting and valuable. And for those of us who sit here today without a father's love to remember, without all the things that should have been, we take the time to thank God, who's a father to the fatherless, who gathers those left behind as his own children. Happy Father's Day, and thank you for being our dad.
serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Again. Go in God's grace and his love. He is our heavenly father. Happy Father's Day. We love you, our father. In Jesus' name, amen.